So Maurice is not feeling well. Can you hear now? So Maurice is not feeling well. And he is taken by his wife, Minnie, to the doctor for a checkup to see what's ailing him. He gives him, the doctor gives Maurice a complete checkup. And then he calls Millie in alone to his office and he says, your husband has a serious, serious illness. And uh, it's brought on by overdue stress. As a matter of fact, if we don't do anything about it, he's going to die. But I have a regime that if you follow, it's going to pull him back from the brink. Now here's the regime. As soon as you get home, Put him to bed. Make him as comfortable as you possibly can. Lots of pillows and everything. Give him a nice big kiss and put him to sleep. In the morning, wake him up with another nice kiss. Serve him a lovely breakfast in bed. Anything he wants. Then a nice massage would be good to relieve the stress. And after that, if he wants to watch television, allow him to watch television. Anything he wants, even if it interferes with you watching your favorite program. Whatever you do, don't ask him to do any tasks around the house. And please do not argue with him. Uh, even if he makes fun of you or teases you, just laugh it off. Later, feed him a lovely, lovely dinner. Give him another massage. And if he has any little whim, you know what I mean. Satisfy him to the best of your ability. Do this every day <coughs> for the next six months and we can save Maurice. On the way home, Maurice eagerly asks Millie, what did the doctor say? And she replies, he said you're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I don't want to be the party pooper here, but I think, Don't no, I think we have to be clear about something. Some of the great philosophers in the Western history of philosophy would say that joking about death is not a good idea. That's just another way of denying it. You know, people like Kierkegaard, the Danish philosopher in the 19th century, and then all the existentialists afterwards who were influenced by him, they said, you know, you can't do that. You can't deny death. You've got to look it straight in the eye. And joking around is just another way of, of distancing yourself from it. And, you know, there was a guy named Ernest Becker, who was a cultural anthropologist in the 20th century. He wrote a book in the 1970s called The Denial of Death. And that was the theme of the book. The book won a Pulitzer Prize. And the idea of the, of the book was that every culture invents these ways of denying death, you know? from religions that promise pie in the sky when we die to uh, all kinds of tribalism, you know? If we belong to the Cherokee tribe or the tribe of Boston liberals or the tribe of young Republicans or the tribe of golfers, that's really a way of dealing with our death anxiety, you know? And he said that happens in a couple ways. One, it sort of blunts this feeling of being alone and vulnerable and having a time-limited life, it gives us some comfort in numbers. But the other thing is groups live on. You know, that's one thing groups do is they live on, they outlive us. And so somehow unconsciously we think that, well, if we're part of some cause, the cause lives on, and somehow that means that I live on too, although it doesn't make an awful lot of sense on the surface of it. But that's sort of what we do with it. Uh, and it doesn't strike me personally as a bad strategy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, thinking about death gives me the willies. <laughs> and uh, the willies, it gives me the phantoms. Uh, uh, I remember, uh, you know, as we were writing this book and we were thinking about the big D, I remembered that the worst time I had confronted my mortality was actually when I was a kid. I was about nine or ten. My, my mother reminded me of this. But I got, you know, uh, tot angst. I would just, I had suddenly realized that I was mortal and that everybody around me was mortal and that we lived for a certain amount of time. And that certain amount of time was finite as compared to infinite time, <laughs> as compared to eternity. It didn't, it struck me as unfair. 
<laughs> and it struck me as uh, terrifying. Uh, somehow, as you know, as I got older, I got distracted by various tribalisms, <laughs> <laughs> like Boston liberal. <laughs> uh, uh, I was able to mute it somehow and, and to uh, get on with my life. But you know, then when I I read Kierkegaard, you know, here we are. These we're old guys, and, uh, you know, and we might. <laughs> especially Tom. <laughs> you know, we're going back to read these people who we read when we were, well, you know, the age of few students, we, uh, way back in the 50s and 60s. Kierkegaard and, and uh, Heidegger, uh, Sigmund Freud's essay. Uh, Freud was, you know, is known as uh, you know, the father of psychoanalysis and mother of the unconscious, but he's, uh, he was also a philosopher. And he wrote a, an essay, uh, which is still astounding to read, called The Future of an Illusion. And the idea was that we made up religions and we made up other cultural artifacts so that we would have some death denial systems, some way that made us less anxious, or not anxious at all, actually welcoming death. But he called these mass illusions. But one of the things that he said was wrong with this strategy, and Becker says this too, is that they don't really work very well. You know, if we identify ourselves with some tribe, you know, a religion, let's say, or a cultural group, or a tribe of some kind, the, one of the first things that happens, if we have this group or this cause that we invest ourselves in as a matter of life and death, and we stake our lives on their having the answer, the thing that keeps us from having a meaningless death, then you come along and you have a different one of those. And if you have a different one, that threatens me because if you're right, I'm wrong. And so Freud says that's how wars get started. You know, tribal wars like in Rwanda, or religious wars like in Iraq or Northern Ireland with the Protestants and Catholics. And there's a comedian named Emo Phillips. Anybody know Emo Phillips? Mm -hmm. Has a great story that nails this right on the head. He says, I was out walking one night, and he said, I walked across a bridge, and he said, there's a guy standing on the railing of the bridge, and he's about to jump off. And so I ran up to him, and I said, whoa, whoa, wait, wait a minute, let's talk here for a second. The guy says, there's nothing to talk about. He says, no, no, give me a chance here. He said, are you religious? And the guy says, yeah, I'm religious, so what? I said, well, well I'm religious too. Well, let's, let's just chat here a minute, don't do anything hasty. He said, uh, are you Christian or Jewish or Buddhist or what are you? The guy says, I'm Christian. He says, I'm Christian too. I'm Christian too. He says, uh, what, are you Protestant, Catholic, or Greek Orthodox? What are you? He says, I'm Protestant. I'm, I'm Protestant. I'm Protestant too. Let's, let's just keep talking here. Um, are you, uh, you know, what denomination of Protestant are you? He says, oh, I belong to this strange little part of Protestant sect. It's called the Baptist Church of God. <laughs> this is amazing. I, I must have been sent here to you. I am Baptist Church of God. He said, are you Baptist Church of God reformed, or are you Baptist, <laughs> Baptist Church of God traditional? The guy says, I'm Baptist Church of God reformed. I said, it's unbelievable. I am Baptist Church of God reformed. He says, are you Baptist Church of God reformation of 1917, <laughs> or are you Baptist Church of God reformation of 1879? And the guy said, I'm Baptist Church. Reformed, Baptist Church of God, Reformed, Reformation of 1879. So I said, die, you heretic scum, and I pushed him <laughs> off the bridge. <laughs> I see we can all relate, right? We've all had those conversations. And that's exactly Becker's point, of course. You know, if, if we think that joining the Reformed Baptist Church of God, Revolution, or Reformation of 1879, is going to save us from a meaningless death, you got to look out, because somebody is always going to be willing to push you off the bridge unless you push them off first. But on the other hand, Freud said, it's hard not to identify with some cultural delusion. Because for one thing, death is so scary to us that you know, we need some way, as Danny was saying, of relieving that anxiety and getting in touch with something else that distracts us or solves the problem for us in some way. Plus, it's hard to resist buying into a cultural delusion because everybody around you is buying into the same delusion. 
Part of my job and our partnership is to find a joke that illustrates deep philosophical ideas. <laughs> <laughs> it's a thankless job. <laughs> So I'm handed the prospect, or the, the, the project, rather, of, of how am I going to illustrate a commonly held delusions? And I have to reach back to fourth grade. <laughs> uh, fourth grade jokes aren't bad, actually. Any fourth graders here? <laughs> so Clara goes to the psychiatrist, and she says, I've got this terrible problem. My husband thinks he's a refrigerator. The psychiatrist says, don't. Don't worry about it. It's a harmless delusion. I'm sure it'll pass. And she says, you don't understand. He sleeps with his mouth open, and the little light keeps me awake. <laughs> <laughs> Shared delusion. <laughs> it's very funny, Danny, but you're still going to die. I hate yeah. that. <laughs> you know, strangely enough, a, a lot of these philosophers who tell us not to deny death and to look at right smack in the eye and constantly be aware of it, actually think that's good news. You know, they think they're telling us something uplifting. For example, there, there was a philosopher in the German guy in the, in the 19th century, Arthur Schopenhauer. And Schopenhauer had read Buddhist texts in an early European translation, so he knew Buddhism. And so he sort of came at Buddhism philosophically, and he said, you know, life's an illusion anyway, so death should just be a matter of indifference to us, you know? If life is, is meaningless and life is illusory, what's the big whoop about death? So we should just be indifferent to it. Don't pay any attention to it. Who cares? Interestingly enough, there are lots of jokes about indifference to death, mostly about other people's deaths. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell them. <laughs> this is also an interesting thing. You know, in our other books, I have gone back to my immense storehouse of Jewish jokes. And there are a lot of Jewish jokes about death, but a gold mine. Scandinavian. <laughs> also, the people who brought us Kierkegaard <laughs> and Pamela. It's a cheery bunch of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ole and Lena have been married for 50 years. And Ole dies. And so she comes down to Oslo to report it to the Norske Dagblad obituary writer. And he says, Well, Lena, what do you want to say? And she said, Oh, just say, oh, they died. And he said, now, come on, Lena, you were married for 50 years. You had children. You had grandchildren. Ole was very popular in the community. And anyway, if it's money you're worried about, first five words are free. <laughs> and she says, oh, OK. How about, oh, they died, vote for sale. <laughs> <laughs> this one is certainly Schopenhauer indifference. <laughs> but not to her own death, you'll notice. Okay. What Schopenhauer, as philosophers do, had to push it one step further. You know, they're, they're always taking us to the brink. And so he said something even more radical than that. And he said that it's our will to live that's our enemy. You know, it's because we have this crazy, perverted will to live that we have death anxiety. That's what causes death anxiety. So if we just give up the will to live and embrace death, <laughs> there goes the anxiety. Somehow I don't find this comforting. <laughs> <laughs> but it is interesting, you know, as we were going over these things, the biggest, I mean, I alluded to it a moment ago, the biggest philosophers, the most the ones who have lived on and are still with us, people like well, Heidegger's dead, but he's a recent philosopher, they all come from Northern Europe. And search as we did, we couldn't find a really good death philosopher who lived on the Riviera. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so easy to be in denial when the sun's shining. So Martin Heidegger, whom Nanny just mentioned, was also German. And uh, he was one of the long train of existentialists that started with Kierkegaard. And uh, one of the things that, that he said, and here, here he has something in common with Freud. He said, we're always finding a way to deny death. You know, we'll always look for a way to weasel out of it, some way of pushing it lower in our consciousness so that we're not facing reality, we're not facing it head on. It's, it's like the, the woman who went to mass, and she's sitting down in the front row, and, and the priest is building up a head of steam. He's talking about repentance and damnation and the consequences of hell. 
And he, at one point he says, you must take this seriously and you must take it seriously now. This very week, some member of this parish may very well die. And the little old lady sitting in the front row starts to laugh. He looks down and he says, what in the world are you laughing at? She says, I'm not a member of the parish. <laughs> So she sort of misses the point that all of us are going to die. Some of us just die a little sooner than others. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you ever see the expression uh, often in newspapers, he died an untimely death? <laughs> <laughs> that was right up there in like the signs that say, expect delay. So <laughs> 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 Took a minute, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, the idea, at least for me, and I'm granted a, a hard case, uh, uh, if you can't live for an eternity, especially at the age of 70, the idea of whether I live to 75 or 76 seems like a quibble. <laughs> of course, ask me again when I'm 75, and I'll probably give you another answer. But, you know, just a, a story that illustrates the flexibility and arbitrariness of it. It's about Phil who goes to the doctor. He's not feeling well either. It's a busy day. It's a health care. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the doctor gives him a, a checkup and he says, Phil, I'm sorry to tell you, you only have six months to live. And Phil, oh my God, six months to live. This is terrible. Just goes crazy. And he says, doctor, on top of everything else, I can't afford to pay my bill right now. And the doctor says, okay, I'll give you a year to live. <laughs> <laughs> that truly is a health care <laughs> But again, these guys have to push it to the limit. And Heidegger says, you know, it's even more radical than that. It's not in our best interest to deny our death. You know, we actually need the anxiety of death to keep us fully alive. He says, you know, if you, if you deny death, you sort of sink into what he called everydayness. You know, one day just goes into the next. You know, you find you're watching golf on TV. You know, I mean, you can't remember what you did yesterday. But if you keep death, <laughs> if you keep death before your before your mind, you're gonna walk with a different zip. You're gonna get more out of life. Yeah, I remember when we were students many years ago, uh, and uh, my parents were very disappointed that I majored in philosophy. <laughs> I wish they had lived to see it, I guess. So. Anyway, uh, and, and I, both of us were very, uh, he was pre divinity and I was pre joke. <laughs> and, uh, people would ask us, what is existentialism all about? And I had my snappy answer, which was, to be fully alive, you have to think about death all the time. <laughs> that was the big lesson of Sartre and, and, uh, and uh, Heidegger. But, but, you know, we, we did come up with kind of what we think is kind of a nifty metaphor that kind of does make sense out of what Heidegger is saying. You know, we said, imagine you're Kevin Garnett, and it's game seven of the NBA Finals. You're going to play with much more intensity. You're going to play with much more drive. You're going to play with much more life. You know, you're going to play with much more joie de vivre than some mid-season game on a Thursday night in Charlotte, right? That's why we watch the Game 7. Nobody watches the Thursday night game in, in Charlotte. So, you know, that's, that's sort of what he's saying. You know, that if, if you're really conscious of the fact that it's going to end someday, it's going to make a difference in how you live. Yeah, and this is where, again, I uh, <coughs> separate myself from Heidegger. I'd rather spend an eternity in Charlotte. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Have you been to Charlotte recently? <laughs> yeah, I would. I'd, I'd rather spend an eternity doing... You know, half awake and not fully engaged in life. <laughs> you know, then two hours fully engaged. Does that make me a schmuck? <laughs> okay, well, we'll try this one then. Jean Paul Sartre sort of followed in Heidegger's footsteps, and he had his own way of saying a similar thing. He said that the significance of death is that the poor soi has become an aswa, right? No. <laughs> well, what he said was that the four it like <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretending too, so you know we're in this together. Um, the for itself has become an in itself. 
little explanation. He said, material objects are in themselves. You know, this music stand has a certain essence that was stamped on it when it was created. And it's not going to change that. You know, it's this like Aristotelian essentialism. An object has its, which has no will, has its essence stamped on it. Yeah, so it comes with this essence which it can't change. He says that's not the situation of human beings. We're pourçois, we're for ourselves. And by that he meant we don't have any essence given to us. You know? We don't come with an essence stamped on us. We have to invent ourselves. You know? We have to take responsibility for creating who we are. And he said, you know, on the one hand, he said, that's a terrific, heady freedom, you know? We're in charge. We're going to decide who we are. We're going to take responsibility for our own lives. But he said, on the other hand, it's wicked scary. He didn't use the word wicked, but he said, <laughs> he used <laughs> mall. <laughs> he said, you know, that's, that's a very, very scary thing. And here's where it ties into death. He said, if you had all the time in the world, if life never came to an end, if you had an infinite amount of time, it wouldn't matter what you did, you know, what you chose to do how you invented yourself today. You know, suppose you make a mistake. Well, you can do that for three centuries, and then you still have an infinite <laughs> amount of time left. You can do something else. But because we only have a limited time, it becomes very scary to choose who we are, what we're going to be. Those of you who haven't chosen a major yet, you know what we're talking about. <laughs> but it's scary. It's anxiety-provoking. There are so many possibilities, you know? And some of them may be very wrong for you. Some of them may be very right for you. So we have, to, we have to take that responsibility. The other thing that I forced Tom to consider when we did this book is that not everybody is, a, is of a philosophical turn of mind. Oh, can I say one more thing before you say oh, that? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> there was sort of a tag ending to what Sartre was saying that, that, that relates to what we're talking about here this morning. He said, because it's so scary, even though we're really poor soi, we're for ourselves, self-inventors, we choose to be an oswa. We choose to be a thing. Now, not a thing like a music stand, but some static part of our personality. We identify with something. You know, I am, you know, uh, somebody who rose to the top of my profession, or I am a punk rocker. Or I am, you didn't know I was a punk rocker, did you? No. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or I am a Republican. What, you know, whatever. We, we choose to be some static thing. And the reason we do that is because it's sc so scary to be in charge of choosing who we're going to be that we'd rather be something. And he said, you know, on the one hand, that doesn't make a lot of sense that the way you're trying to avoid the anxiety of death is by essentially dying and becoming static, but that's in fact what we do psychologically. Uh, uh, <coughs> the one that you may be familiar with is from uh, Being in Nothingness, such as uh, Vatra et Neolt, where he talks about somebody who's a waiter. Remember Sartre's waiter? The idea that somebody invests his whole essence in being a waiter, and then he's this thing. He acts like, he's, be he's, he's portraying a waiter but there's no self there. And, and uh, sometimes I, I don't get my mind around it, but Tom and I had dinner at what was Chow Bella down the street the other day, and we had a Sartrean waiter. <laughs> he kept saying, is everything going all right here? Are you still working on this? Uh, I don't know, it just went on and on and on, and I realized there was no there there. She had totally invested herself in being a waiter, but she was no longer a poor swap. So, Person. I'm sure there was after she left the job. <laughs> yeah, I forgot to tell you, I met her afterwards for drinks. It's okay. <laughs> Anyhow, if you leave the philosophers aside, one of the most popular and one that I sometimes can feel for, idea of, of preserving our uh, life is living in the hearts and minds of those who remain alive after we're dead. That's very, very yeah, that can be kind of tricky, though, too, Danny, because, you know, it sort of assumes a kind of sentimentality on the part of our loved ones that may not be, you know, there. I do and <laughs> know a case of that, Stanley Goldfarb. Stanley died, man. Went, you know, everybody went to 
the synagogue and they had all the prayers for the dead and then it got to later in the program and the rabbi called for somebody to say a few kind words about old Stanley. Nothing. Nobody stirred. The rabbi gets a little vexed. He says, now come on, that's traditional. Somebody come forward and say a few kind words about Stanley Goldfarb. Nothing. Finally, the rabbi says, come on! <laughs> Somebody must have something. The old schlep in the back comes up to the front and he says, well, I'll tell you this about old Stanley. His brother Herbie, he was worse. <laughs> <laughs> That's the danger of trying to live on in the hearts of your loved ones. You know, Woody Allen said, I don't want to live on in the hearts of my countrymen. I want to live on in my apartment. <laughs> There's another story that demonstrates the fallibility of this memory in the hearts of others. And it's about Jack and Jenny, uh, very happily married, 40 years. It's time for Jack's funeral. They go to Woodlawn Cemetery. They have a very nice service. Jenny is wailing and weeping. Then it's time to wheel the coffin out in the trolley. And as they get to the doorway, it hits the door frame. And as the coffin hits the door frame, they hear, Ow! It's Jack inside. <laughs> Open it up, Jack. Fully alive. He steps out. They go home. Jack and Jenny live for another 10 years. And then Jack really bites it. Again, she has the service at Woodlawn Cemetery, they the service, a lot of weeping and wailing, then wheeling out on the trolley, and just as the trolley gets towards the door, Jenny yells, watch out for the door frame! <laughs> <laughs> of course, it helps if, if you leave some money to your survivors. <laughs> That, that way, you know, every time my niece <coughs> Tiffany buys a new pair of snakeskin pumps, she'll say, oh, thank you, Uncle Tommy. Or, or maybe, thank you for dying, Uncle Tommy. <laughs> but either way, my, my, my name lives on. Yeah, that reminds me of something that I've been meaning to tell you about. Do you remember when we went fishing up in uh, northern Maine? Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was a big storm. We had the car broke down. We had to find a place to sleep, and we found this lovely farmhouse. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah we on the door, lovely, gorgeous widow there, opened the door and said we could stay in her guest suites there. I remember very well. Yeah, well, I, I, uh, nine months after that, I, uh, I heard from her lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. Did you happen to get up in the middle of the night and uh, pay her a visit? Um, yeah, I did. Why? <laughs> did you happen to give my name instead of yours? <laughs> Yes, I'm sorry. I, I did. Why do you ask? She died and left everything to me. <laughs> you, just, you just can't play the head when you're dead. <laughs> well, I'm very, very happy for you. Really? No, really I am. Of course, the point is that after you're dead and gone, you sort of lose control over uh, what your loved, how your loved ones remember you. You know, and besides, maybe that's not really the most important goal. You know, the, the world religious leaders, uh, Jesus, for example, said that, you know, we shouldn't uh, to strive to, live, to uh, earn the esteem of other people. You know, what we should be looking after is the care of our own soul. Yeah, but not, you don't get to everybody with that, especially lawyers. <laughs> Do you remember our classmate, classmate uh, Marty, who became a lawyer? Yeah, Marty yeah. the lawyer. Yeah, Marty the lawyer. <laughs> uh, yeah, he was asleep one night. And he woke up with this kind of sulfurous stench in his, his nostrils. And he opens his eyes, and it's this kind of purple light all around him. And he looks, and there sitting at the foot of his bed is Satan himself. And Satan says, Marty the lawyer? <laughs> he says, Marty, I am going to give you a long, wonderful life full of fortune and fame and all the beautiful bed partners you could ever ask for. And Marty said, what's the catch? And Satan says, well, in exchange for that, I would like your immortal soul. And Marty says, no, what's the real catch? <laughs> <laughs> Some people, of course. 
Some people, of course, think that it's the soul. The soul is the part of us that, that lives on after the body dies. And uh, Woody Allen, though, said uh, he, he was afraid there is an afterlife, but nobody would know where it was being held. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, you know, the whole idea of heaven is really kind of shaky. You know, a lot of people think the idea of our idea of heaven, the popular idea of heaven, comes from the New Testament. That isn't really right. You know, the, the idea in the New Testament of eternal life is something that happens at the end of history. You know, it isn't something that, you know, the moment you die, you go join your loved ones and your dog and so on and so forth. You know, it's something at the, at the end of time. When is that exactly? <laughs> You've asked. No, it is interesting. The, the, we learned a lot uh, putting together uh, this book, and one was this idea of heaven. I originally, I'm not a New Testament scholar the way Tommy is, I was always assumed that it was in the New Testament, that, you know, the whole deal, the pearly gates, the low-hanging fruit, the nurse, <laughs> you know, the Savannah section. Well, some, <laughs> some of the imagery actually is, of course. You know, like the pearly gates are in the book of Revelation. But even the book of Revelation isn't about a heaven that you go to, you know, the moment you die. It's, a, it's again, it's a vision, he says, in the very beginning of the book. So this is a vision of the end of history. Eschatology, as the dean said, you know, the end, the last things, the end of history. What is interesting is, is how culturally the idea of heaven arrived here, particularly in the West. And, and uh, painters, people like Hieronymus Bosch, and, uh, they started. Uh, one track was they portrayed Eden, which is biblical, the Old Testament, which does have a, a lot of the old hanging fruit. <laughs> Some of it hanging a little too low, yeah, as I remember, yeah. Right. As, as heaven on earth. And therefore, to sort of work backwards by analogy, heaven must look like heaven on earth. And, and so then we got this kind of uh, very fruity, and, <laughs> uh, you know, having lots of animals who are friendly with one another, uh, and people in uh, robes, togas. <laughs> That's not quite like the Garden of Eden, though. I remember they took off the choir robes, oh, right? The X-rated stuff. And then it was picked up by illustrators, particularly children's book illustrators. Uh, you know, doggy heaven, all kinds of uh, heaven as a way to make death bearable to young people. Uh, and then uh, cartoonists, and then it was really uh, Hollywood. Uh, there were all sorts of uh, uh, European filmmakers. They really filled in our idea of heaven. And, and, and the most recent one, we saw a whole bunch of them. It's really interesting. We saw a of movies. The most recent one, which was sort of, because they had gotten to post-Star Wars digitalization, you could put anything you wanted in there, was uh, that Robin Williams film called What Dreams May Come, or I think that's what it was, takes place in heaven. And uh, it, uh, for me, you know, maybe it's because I'm an old guy, it was sensory overload heaven. You know, that everything was hard art on the walls, <laughs> lawn chairs everywhere. It was it was a jewel or a babe or something. It was, it was not my idea of a restful home. <laughs> but maybe it was for young people. Where was I? I think you were going to talk about how jokes actually became a source of... Uh, oh, yeah. yeah so, so we, came, we, became we have one brain between us. Yeah. So <laughs> and neither of them are awake. <laughs> uh, because we often go to jokes and cartoons uh, uh, you know, to use as illustrations, it was interesting to find that cartoons were a source, probably much more than the New Testament, of our ideas of heaven. The cartoons. It turns out when we look through uh, all you know, the, uh, the New Yorker cartoon bank, the three top locales are psychiatrist's office, <laughs> desert island, <laughs> and St. Peter deciding whether or not you're, uh, you know, you make the grade. And uh, and they seem to have cartoons and jokes seem to have developed the idea of St. Peter as this uh, gatekeeper more than. Certainly, then you'll find the New Testament. I mean, St. Peter is there, and the gates are there. But the idea of him at this exclusive club, uh, <laughs> you, you know, saying, you get in, you don't, is, uh, is really a, a fancy of the culture. And I'd like to tell one of my St. Peter jokes that has contributed to it. That's about this guy who goes to St. Peter at the gates, and, and St. Peter says, well, Phil, he says, you know, 
done with work that your wife can't seem to have done anything particularly interesting one way or the other, kind of a blah life, so we don't know how to dispose of you at this time. And he's <laughs> talked to God, he doesn't say anything either. Is there any story that you can tell us that would help us decide your fate up here? And Phil says, well, I don't know. And there was that time I'm riding along and I see this innocent young woman being harassed by a gang of bikers. I pulled the car over and I walked up to them and I said, you leave this young woman alone. And just then the boss, the head biker, steps forward. He's got long flowing hair and he's got tattoos all over his muscly arms and he's got one of those nose rings. And he says, says who? And I said, says me. And I yanked the nose ring right out of his oh. nose. About a minute ago. <laughs> <laughs> or, or there were these three guys waiting, waiting to get in. And St. Peter comes out and he says, gentlemen, he said, we're a little overcrowded today. So he said, I'm going to have to set some rules here. He said, I'm only going to let people in who have had a very bad day. Mm -hmm. So he takes the first guy apart separately and he says, Okay, tell me what kind of day you had. The guy said, I had a day you would not believe. He said, I live on the sixth floor of my building. And he said, I was out on the balcony and I was doing aerobic exercises. He says, I was doing jumping jacks. And he said, I lost my balance and I fell over the railing. He said, I'm falling down toward the ground. He said, I reached out in desperation and he said, I grabbed the railing of the fifth floor balcony. And so I said, thank God, I'm hanging there by the tips of my fingers. He said, all of a sudden, this maniac comes out of the fifth floor apartment with a hammer. And he starts pounding on my fingers. And he said, I lose my grip, and I fall all the way to the ground. But again, fortunately, I landed in a bush. And he said, it broke my fall. So I said, I'm thanking my lucky stars, when all of a sudden, I look up, and the guy in the fifth floor apartment has his refrigerator. And he throws it over the balcony. It lands on me and crushes me. St. Peter says, geez, I've heard some bad stories, but that's a bad one. He said, you can, you can go on in. So then he calls the, calls the second guy up, and he says, uh, what kind of day did you have? The guy says, oh, man. He said, I had one terrible day. He said, you know, I had this suspicion that my wife was cheating on me. And so he said, I came home from work early. I thought, I'm going to catch this son of a gun. So he said, I walk in, and he said, my wife is there. He said, I don't see anybody else. But you know how sometimes you just have that sense that there's somebody else in the room? So I said, I look in the closets. I look under the bed, nothing. So he says, a last chance. He said, I go out on the balcony. And sure enough, there's the guy hanging. <laughs> hanging from the railing. So he said, I go back inside. I get my hammer. And I beat on his fingers. He said he falls to the ground. He lands in this bush that breaks his fall. So he said, I went and got the refrigerator. And he said, I dumped it on him. And it, it did crush him. But he said, it also caused me to have a heart attack. And I died. And St. So Peter says, can't help smiling a little bit. But he says, you know, God, that is a very, very bad day. He says, you go on into. So he calls the third guy up. And he says, uh, OK, what kind of day did you have? The guy said, I had a horrible day. He said, picture this. I'm naked, hiding in a refrigerator. <laughs> See, what's interesting is that everybody understands the premise of these jokes, the idea of St. Peter the Gatekeeper. I mean, it's common knowledge. It's part of our cultural knowledge. And yet it's not biblical. So that's kind of interesting. It turns out that heaven and hell are, in many ways, not even religiously determined, but culturally determined. Uh, secular culture has determined that. And we discovered that even the French have their very own heaven and hell. For example, Fury has been a good little Frenchman and went straight to heaven. And uh, after a while, he misses his friend Andre, who's a little Michonne. And he was in hell. And, uh, typical in these jokes, he's permitted to visit him. So he goes down, led by Satan. Satan leads him down the hallway, and there is this grand, beautiful suite, and he looks in, and there is Andre sitting on a lounge chair with a tray of hors d'oeuvres next to him and a champagne flute in his hand, and a 
gorgeous naked woman sitting in his lap. Mm. And Philippe says, Andre, this is hell? Mm. And Andre says, ah, oh, but of course it is. He says, this cheese. <laughs> it's Belgian. <laughs> and then the champagne kid, this is not champagne, it's from California. <laughs> and the woman, Sacre Bleu, she's my first wife. <laughs> you know, a lot of people have worried that no matter how fabulous paradise is, that it would get boring after enough time, you know, after a few centuries of playing the harp, that might begin to, to get old, if you know what I mean. You know, like Woody Allen said, eternity is a long time, especially near the end. <laughs> the, the idea of eternity, even uh, eternal in the, a celestial place, as uh, bringing on that old existential ennui, is in something that's just a borderline between a fable and a joke. So, not feel required to laugh. It's the, story, <laughs> it's the story of Gil, an inveterate fisherman, and he's fishing by his favorite steam, uh, stream uh, for salmon. He takes a while, but he finally snags a nice 40-pound salmon, pulls it in, gives him a lot of fight, he finally gets it in, but the strain is too much, cardiac arrest. And some indefinite time later, he opens his eyes, and he's he's inside this celestial stream that's teeming with salmon, golden light raining down upon it. And he sees next to him the state of the art, Rodden Reel, who picks it up, casts instantly, he gets a 70 pound salmon, holds it in, puts it on the bank behind him, casts again, 80 pound salmon, <laughs> holds it in, puts it on the bank beside him. This goes on and on for the entire afternoon. The whole bank is lined with these beautiful, pristine salmon. He's starting to feel a little bit kind of lack of enthusiasm. A little bit of that old, is that all there is? But as a matter of fact, he doesn't really feel like fishing anymore. And just then, he sees a man walking towards him up the stream. And he says to him, this is heaven? And the man says, you think so? Hmm. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> I told you it was <laughs> You know, a, a lot of people think that seances are sort of proof that there is an afterlife. The fact that we can contact our loved ones in the, in the great beyond. And interestingly enough, there were even a number of philosophers around the turn of the 20th century. Uh, like the, the uh, philosopher William James, who taught at Harvard in the 1890s when Danny and I were there. <laughs> um, he, of course, from his brother Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> they, he got very interested. He got very interested in, in seances. And uh, he was trying to keep an open mind. He knew a lot of them were fraudulent. But he thought that there just might be somebody legit out there who really could make contact with the beyond. There was another legitimate philosopher, Sidgwick, the British ethicist. He was convinced, you know, a very rational guy. He was convinced that these seances were uh, on, on the up and up. Yep. I know of one case where it was iffy at best, and that's the story of, of, about this guy now, a ventriloquist, and he was out of work, you know, and Sullivan was dumb, variety shows were all over, our mitzvahs weren't doing ventriloquists. <laughs> he goes to his agent, and he says, can you get me anything? I'm desperate. And he says, no, ventriloquists just, you know, they, they're not in anymore. He says, but I had one client who made a go of it as a medium. He opened a seance bar. He says, well, some money, finds a storefront, puts up a shingle, and sure enough, in walks a woman, recent uh, widow, and she says, I'd like to talk to my late husband, Herbie. What does it cost? And he says, well, I have kind of a sliding scale. He says, for 50 bucks, you can ask Herbie a yes or no question, and he'll answer yes with one knock, no with two knocks. Then for $300, what you can do is ask an open-ended question, and Herbie will answer you at length in his own voice, for as long as you know. And then there's my $1,000 special. And she says, oh, what's the $1,000 special? He says, it's a little like the 300 thing. You ask Herbie anything you want. He answers you at length. But all the while, I drink a glass of water. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
So it doesn't seem like we better count on uh, seances as being our proof of uh, the immortality of the soul. Maybe we better stick with the great philosophers. You know, there, were, there was another existentialist, Albert Camus, who said one of the most interesting things about death, in fact, about suicide, in the beginning of his book, The Myth of Sisyphus, the very opening is, there is but one truly serious philosophical problem, and that's the problem of suicide. And what he meant is, and he goes on to say, judging whether life is or is not worth living amounts to answering the fundamental question of philosophy. And of course, what he's saying here is that once you, you realize that suicide is an option and you choose not to commit suicide, then you've chosen life, you know? You've chosen to take responsibility for your life, you know? In Sartre's terms, you've, you've decided to begin the lifelong journey of creating yourself. Pretty profound. Yeah, and, and I, I do think it's quite profound, but what Camus assumes in this is a certain amount of intelligence on the part of the person uh, who's contemplating suicide. Because I do know of this one case. Again, it's infidelity. Infidelity and death seem to be intertwined. <laughs> he suspected his wife of infidelity. He comes home early. He finds his wife naked in bed with his nephew. And he goes crazy. He goes ballistic. He feels awful. He yells, I can't take this anymore any longer. I just can't live knowing this. And he takes a gun out and he puts it at his temple. He says, I'm going to kill myself. And the wife and the neighbor just laugh. And he says, don't laugh, you're next. somebody who didn't understand the But here's, here's some possible good news. We, we like to end on an upbeat note. There are actually scientists, maybe some of them right here in this very university, who are taking a look now at doing away with death altogether. You know, you've probably read about... And biological death. Yeah. You probably probably uh, probably heard of some of these strategies, cryogenics. You know, there are guys who are experimenting with freezing ourselves. Ted Williams, but unlike Ted, the best time apparently to freeze yourself if it's really going to work out for you is before you die. So that's a bit of a leap of faith, and for one thing, it, it assumes that somebody's going to remember to thaw you out. You know, a hundred years from now. <laughs> <laughs> After your disease is cured, you know, I can't remember to take the chicken out of the freezer for dinner. 300 years from now, somebody's going to remember to thaw me out. But anyway, that's one, cryogenics. Uh, another one is cloning. You know, some people are saying, well, if we just keep cloning ourselves, you know, there'll always be a little me coming along, <laughs> coming along behind me. It's a kind of eternity. You know, it raises a little bit of a question of, you know, who's, who owns the self here? If there are five of me, and I'm me, who's this little guy? But in any case, you know, it's a, it's a thought, it's an idea. And then there's a really freaky one that some scientists are working on. This is probably at MIT. This sounds a little... <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's uh, it's the, the strategy of downloading our entire nervous system and our personality onto a computer and chip. And our memories, all our memories. And all our memories onto a computer chip. Really out there. And this one raises some of the similar problems uh, philosophically and psychologically, I guess, uh, as, as the cloning one. You know, who's me? If we have this computer chip, and I say, are you Tommy Cathcart? And he says, sure am. And are you Mary Galloway? Yep, I am. And do you live in New York? He <laughs> says all these things. Do you hang out with this guy, Danny? Yeah, I have to. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, do you remember the time when we uh, visited Ron Buzz? Oh, yeah, I remember. Um, but is, he has all these memories, all the same memories as this time. Probably more. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, yeah. <laughs> but is he Tommy? When he says, I am Tommy, this is me, I think I'll go to sleep right now. Is he the same guy? These are interesting questions. Um, but one thing that we discovered looking at this rather eagerly, the idea of bio-immortality, it even has a name now, uh, is that even the ones that were, wrote with uh, telomeres, you know, those ends uh, that get shorter as you get older and uh, until they go kaput, none of them, uh, and, and so if you can work on that, you might be able to end the aging process. But the very best case for guys like me is that they, they live in 70 to an eternity. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of a bummer. Yeah. But I don't think they can, can rewind, and no. nobody's working on rewinding the aging clock, are they? No, no, that's because it's young people working on it. <laughs> 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 one of the reasons uh, why, I 
I'm not sure I'd like to be 70 is summed up in my final little gag. <laughs> so there's this 70-year-old guy walking down the street. And somebody calls him, and he looks down, and it's a frog. And the frog says, Moish, pick me up, kiss me. I turn into a beautiful princess and will make passionate love all night long. Moish leans over, picks up the frog, sticks him in his pocket, and he keeps walking. After a while, the frog says, Moish, I don't think you heard me. You gotta kiss me. I turn into a beautiful princess, and we make love all night. And Moish said, I heard you, froggy. At my age, I'd rather have a talking frog. <laughs> You guys are great. We, we've been doing this now for four nights, and you're the best ones yet. <laughs> this is fabulous. We, we thought, who gets up at 10.30 in the morning on a college campus? We didn't know it was parents' weekend. So we thought, we're going to have four people there. Well, this is... I think I know who. <laughs> who? <laughs> what the hell am I going to do with my parents? <laughs> <laughs> you bet. Yeah. Any questions or comments or jokes or whatever? More, more criticism. Now, listen, we were on an NPR show in the Midwest, and somebody uh, called up who was distraught and uh, who believed in the, the whole package of heaven uh, as handed down by uh, Western you know, artifacts. And uh, she was looking forward to seeing her departed ones uh, when she died. We felt terrible. Who are we to disabuse her of, of her thing? It's not like, uh, for my money, higher grade and better ideas. Um, so yeah. if, there's, if anybody has any of those kind of objections, we'll try to respond to those, too. Well, in, in that same line, did you read the book 90 Minutes, from, 90 Minutes in Heaven? Do you no. Have comments on that? Have you read that? Uh, no. Is this, is this a kind of near-death experience, MDE? Yeah. 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 The closest I've come to an NDE is reading Heidegger. <laughs> 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 There's nothing like reading uh, uh, sight on sight in the original. My, my doctor thought thought I had had one. You know, I, I was out of it for a few minutes, and and when I came to. He said, you've, you've actually been dead for 10 minutes. And I said, well, he said, did you experience anything? And I said, yeah. I said, I, I, I saw this blinding light, and then I saw this man in a white coat bend over me. And he said, oh, and, and uh, go ahead. Who was it? I said, it was you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to make light of this. No, I'm not. Uh, but I, I'm skeptical about these near-death uh, experiences. They, uh, what they take as proof is the intersubjectivity. Everybody has the same thing. The long tunnel, they see Frank Sinatra, and, <laughs> and, and then there's you know, a kind of biopic of their lives in the background. Uh, but I think that's from shared thing. And, and the statistic that somehow balances it is that we saw recently that the number of people in the United States, or the percentage of people in the United States, who think they've been abducted by aliens, mm -hmm. and in some cases had some pretty good sex with them, is <laughs> 20 <laughs> So um, it may be one, you know, just one more of Ernest Becker's mass illusions. Uh, or some, maybe they were abducted by aliens, Danny. Yeah, uh, I don't know. It sounds like a great idea. Yeah, this is a minister who claimed that he was. Oh, he's a minister. Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> he was in heaven for 90 huh. minutes yeah. and then brought back. It's huh. interesting that they have a time in heaven. Yeah, it would be. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And 90 you, minutes is called 90 minutes in heaven? We just did it again. We just dissed it, and who knows? It could very well be. And you know what? I hope it is. Yeah. You know, one, actually, there's a philosopher who had something very interesting to say about this. It was William James again. And he said, you know what? These fancy philosophers like Heidegger and Sartre and so forth, he said, they don't come to their conclusion about the meaning of it all any differently than you and I do. He said, you know, they hang a lot of abstract words on it and make it sound like it's a big intellectual thing that they came to. But he said, the way everybody makes their decisions about what really matters, what the life and death values are that we have, is we do it by gut feel. 
you know, we all have to come to our own understanding. And he called it, you know, we all feel the push and pull of the universe pushing us to, toward one idea or another. And he said, guess what? That's the way Heidegger did it too. You know? And then he, he just hung sort of all, this fan, all these fancy words on it and made it sound like it was something that he thought about and got there rationally, but nobody does that. Yeah. So, Once you're into this kind of philosophy, out of the, the more strict rational philosophy, you know, like the British, you know, if somebody asks the British you know, you know, realistic philosopher, what is the meaning of life? He says, first we have to ask, what is the meaning of meaning? <laughs> And <laughs> sit down here for a long time. <laughs> yeah, they would just dismiss all this Heideggerian, Schopenhauer, and Paul Tillich, who's one of our absolute favorites, uh, out of hand because you're in the realm of non rational philosophy. And, uh, and in that sense, I think uh, William James was right. You know, it's, you know, pick your fancy, but if your fancy is here in the gut, that's your fancy. Good question at the back. Yes. I'm, I'm very interested in your proposition that um, most philosophers seem to come from Northern Europe and <laughs> Scandinavia. Clearly, well, you're from Northern Europe. I'm <laughs> <laughs> not from Northern Europe. I'm from the opposite side of the world. Uh -huh. um, oh, New but I'm wondering um, whether you think that that is related to ethnicity or weather or. Cold, um, cold, I think, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Maine, if that helps. I <laughs> and my wife is from Holland, and she's morbid. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. You, you know, in fact, I don't even have a good idea of what part of the U.S. American philosophers even came from. William James was from Boston, of course. Uh, but no, I don't really know. That's an interesting question, though. Just wondering if you've seen that movie, Religiosity. Religious, yeah. I, s no, I just saw the trailer for it. It looked yeah. kind of interesting. It's part of a, 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 a cultural trend right, right now called the New Atheists. Uh, Christopher Hitchens' book, uh, or whatever, God, God is Not Great. Or, yeah, it's yeah. about how religion's bad for our health. Uh, <laughs> Sam Harris's book, The End of Faith. Uh, these guys seem to have discovered you know, something that others have noticed for a while, that religion causes a, a lot of discontent in civilization. <laughs> <laughs> but again, I, I think that to get a handle on this, uh, Becker and Freud uh, are, are pretty good. I mean, you know, I'm listening to the radio the other day, and they're fighting over this piece of real estate in Jerusalem. Uh, Jews call it Temple Mount, uh, Muslims call it the uh, Dome of the Rock. The Dome of the Rock. It's a piece of real estate, but they've invested this piece of real estate in their death denial system. Between oh, uh -huh. the atheists between, you know, atheists say, well, you really have to kind of extend a, an olive branch and, you know, necessarily give people the sense that, well, I can understand why you believe that, I, I believe mm -hmm. differently, and then this new kind of group that's coming out that you're idiots, mm -hmm. if you believe in God, yeah. you're an idiot, mm -hmm. you know, no holds barred. Mm -hmm. Some of the better philosophers said that if you wanted to take a strict philosophical position on this, you'd be an agnostic. Is, but, mm. you know, yet the brain is such an unsolved mystery as far as we go. How much do you get to cross? We don't know a whole, a whole lot about it. People. But there are some interesting books. There's one, in fact, that you gave me, which I haven't read yet, uh, which is a couple of philosophers and a couple of neuroscientists all writing about consciousness from their point of view and trying to find the common ground. Right. And I'm looking forward to it, but we don't really know a lot about the... the it, but in fact, little as we, we know, didn't prevent us from writing about it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, the mind-body problem, which goes, you know, way, way back in the history of philosophy, you know, is, uh, and has taken quite a new twist because of, of your, this interest you have in brain science, you know. Is a thought the same thing uh, as, uh, you know, uh, igniting of a synapse? Other. And uh, 
So we have tried to address that, particularly when we got to this uh, in two areas. One of the immortality of the soul, because in Greek times, uh, which was you know, pre-Christian, and they did talk about something like the soul, but they called it the psyche. Mm -hmm. But that was grouped together, mind, uh, emotions, and... Uh, Will. Will. Uh, and, you know, a few other things. <laughs> and, uh, and it was only later that they... That, that, and they thought it was immortal. They thought it survived the body. Uh, but you know, it only got refined to this idea of a soul, separate from self, separate from mind. And so in order to try to make sense of that, Tom and I had to go a little bit into this uh, perennial problem of, of the mind-body problem and uh, looking at it a little bit from the point of view of neuroscience, but in a limited way because we don't know about it. <laughs> <laughs> and because they don't. <laughs> there, there are some interesting uh, British philosophers who call themselves zombists after zombie. And their, their argument is that the mind is something different from the brain because if you can imagine zombies, we, we haven't met any, but we've been to some pretty <laughs> slow cocktail parties. But <laughs> if, if you can imagine zombies, they move around and do all the stuff we do, except they don't have any consciousness. So these guys say, well, there you go. You know, you can, you, you can <coughs> it is possible to imagine some way to, to do everything that we do ex except not have consciousness. So therefore, consciousness must be something super added. It must be something different. There must be a mind that's different from, from our brain. This, uh, as a matter of fact, the guy who was across behind us in college, Saul Kripke, uh, who's now at the Institute of... Uh, what's the Advanced Study. Advanced Study at Princeton. This is what he's devoted, I mean, brilliant, absolutely brilliant logician. And this is what he's devoted himself to, the zombie problem. <laughs> And I'm still worried about time. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think we have to come to a close now. Okay. Um, this is clearly a very sophisticated audience. Clearly. And I'm sure you have all been thinking, of I, as I have, of that little known passage in Sartre's Being and Nothingness where he says, it won't happen, sadly, until I'm dead and gone. But if you want to see the true essence of wisdom and humor, you'll have to wait for Cat Garden Fly. <laughs> the, the really important thing is they're not witty, humorous, and wise pour soi for themselves. They're not porn for all of us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Books are on sale. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.